Please welcome Robert. Right, good evening. Uh, Dam's Raid, Myths and Legends. Now, some of these will be familiar to you. Some of you, some of them may be familiar to you just as the myths without knowing some of the truth behind. Others are sort of rather old chestnuts which have been thrown in just to sort of add to familiarity. Right, okay. First, the first uh, sort of myth that I'm going to explode is almost heretical at tonight's meeting, but that, that is that the idea of attacking dams did not originate with Barnes-Wallace. With the increase of power of Nazi Germany and the increased threat of war in the 1930s, um, the Air Ministry was well aware of the um, potential for attacking dams. And here, in fact, we have a minutes of a conference of the 17th of July 1939, uh, listing various people there that were involved in it, and you'll see that Wallace's name is not there, but it's 17th of July 1939 to discuss the selection of weapons for the use against reservoir dams in Germany. At the bottom of that page it says that it's desirable to carry out an operation at the early stage in the war, but it cautions that an unsuccessful attack might jeopardise any further attacks when a better weapon is available. At the end of the day, all these committees concluded that we simply did not have a suitable weapon, which is why the dams were not attacked. Wallace steps in because he was the man that would create that suitable weapon to enable an attack to take place. Fast forwarding till after the dams raid, but still looking at sort of the origins of the operation. This is from the Times. 19th of May 1943, two days after the Dams Raid, and it's a letter from uh, a Labour peer, uh, Winster, and he comments that the press are saying that the attack on the German dams is, re is directly related to information given by a, German, uh, by a Jewish refugee, and he fears that reprisals will take place against the Jews in Europe. Now, this isn't surprising because at this time, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of the previous month is still going on. And indeed, on the 16th of May, the day that the dams were breached, the Great Warsaw Synagogue was demolished. And within four months, 56,000 Jews had been killed or taken into concentration camps. Of course, Winston's argument says... Did people think that we only heard of targets from refugees after four years of the war? Yeah, it was ridiculous. Of course, we had a target committee sitting before the war, and as we've just seen, that's perfectly true. Well, of course, that's published in the Times, and the Air Ministry feel obliged to make a response. And they say, well, yes, the public did often provide information for targets. Suggestions were always welcome. But of course, as you can imagine, ideas from the public were often far-fetched, they weren't feasible, or perhaps they were already being considered. And in fact, dams had been suggested by members of the public, but this wasn't the origin of the idea. And I mean, that's perfectly true. However, there is a germ of truth in Winster's letter. Now, in October 1939, here's a mem memorandum on the interrogation of a German émigré. He'd been a Prussian army officer specialising in the harmonisation of water power. He maintained that dams could be damaged by bombing water nearby, not by a direct hit. He said explosions underwater were not symmetrical, and this may have been an allusion to contact explosions which Wallace was eventually worked on for upkeep. It was said that the bombing of the dam would do tremendous damage for very, very low cost, and of course he was right. Despite the high losses to 617 Squadron, 8 out of 19 aircraft, it was relatively low for the amount of damage done. The dams raid was in that case very cost effective. But if we look more closely at this informant, we see that his name was, a, he was Herr Hans Gutmann. He'd been a former officer in the Prussian army. He'd resigned his commission and become an engineer and contractor specialising in water power. He ran two firms, but they'd been taken over by the Nazi party. 
But the telling point in relation to the Winsters uh, reference was that he, in fact, as you will see there, he was a Christian of Jewish descent. Now, could he have been that Jewish emigre to which the letter originally referred? I don't know. I leave you to sort of think, was this an example of somewhere along the line sort of Im information leaking out? I don't know. Now, of course, we know that Wallace carried out tests on model dams at Harmonsworth. Well, actually, they were undertaken by the Road Research Laboratory, not by Wallace. The tests were uh, controlled and instigated by the controller of the Road Research Laboratory. The dams were actually made by one of their employees, uh, a, a chap called Collins. And other tests were also carried out at the building research establishment at Garston near Watford which was an offshoot of the uh, a satellite of the Road Research Laboratories at that time. What they did with their models was to supply Wallace with data. And it was that data that he um, explored and interpreted that gave him the information which he needed to develop upkeep. And in fact, the, ex the explosion that made it all possible, that contact explosion, of detonating a charge directly in contact with the wall, which demolished it when charges exploded away from the wall in the water had failed, that explosion was made possible by an ac accidental uh, detonation or it, uh, an accidental incident where Collins was demolishing a damaged model and put a charge right up against the wall and found to his amazement that a very small charge caused a disproportionate amount of damage. And it was that that spurred Wallace on to devise the develop, uh, delivery method that resulted in upkeep. Now, that's a still from the film, of course, Michael Redgrave there. And if you look at the dam in the background, that's the film company's representation of one of the model dams. And that is one of the actual model dams. That's the one that survives to this day at... Um, the building research establishment at Garston. There's another myth that each of these dams was made of small individual bricks. One of them was, but it was only the central section. And when they built that, they got the scaling wrong. <laughs> so the experiments were mainly carried out on solid uh, concrete dams, um, but it produced the right data. Nothing remains of the model dams at Harmonsworth. And the site is now, the, uh, the, the Harmonsworth Dam site is now where the Colnbrook Immigration Removal Centre uh, stands to the north of Heathrow Airport. But you may be interested to know that later in this year it's intended to unveil a plaque there on the ground very near to where the model dams were sited to commemorate the work of these initial dam busters as the model builders were known. Another myth, upkeep is described as being, behaving like a skimming stone. But apart from the bouncing characteristics, that's where the similarity ends. A skipping stone rotates around a vertical axis. And a French physicist discovered that an angle of 20 degrees between the stone and the water surface is the optimal angle. And changes in speed or rotation of the stone don't alter that fact. As long as the horizontal speed can be maintained, skipping can continue indefinitely. But of course, each time it bounces, it slows down, so it eventually sinks. And I understand that the world record is 40 skips. So if any of you are reaching that next time you're down sort of skimming stones at Chesil Beach, um, you're doing pretty well. So there's the skipping stone around a vertical axis. But in fact, upkeep rotates around a horizontal axis. And the critical angle of ricochet for upkeep is only 7 degrees. The, the rotation around a horizontal axis creates lifts, lift, known as the Flettner effect. So the speed and height of release and the rotation rate can extend the air path of the weapon, at least up to a point. Other critical factors include the weight and the density of the bomb, and the other factor that 
has to be taken into account is that the weapon had a tendency to veer to port after dropping. And that's possibly because of the result of the drive belt being on the right-hand side, the starboard side of the aircraft. And that may have meant that there was a slight delay in release as it came off and, and it just twisted a little bit. But that was a characteristic on the trials films that you'll see that the weapon often tends to curve round in an arc to the left. The question, of course, was how do you actually determine the range of release? Too close to the dam and it can bounce over the top, too far away and it will run out of steam and sink before it reaches the dams. Now, of course, we all know from the, watching the film that there was a simple rangefinder uh, developed working on a simple triangulation principle based on a nice loss-lease triangle. But various other ideas have been considered. For example, pass, uh, passing a prominent landmark and doing a timed run from it, or even dropping as you passed a prominent landmark. There was one wonderful idea which sort of rather pre predates the spotlights used for the height. But someone had the wonderful idea, as you go into attack, you switch the landing light on so that you eventually illuminate the target. <laughs> That's if you ever reach it. And, as, as the, and, and you would set the landing light so that just at the moment that the target comes into the beam's range, that was the point to re release the bomb. Needless to say, nobody even bothered seeing if it was workable in practice. It certainly wasn't going to work operationally. Then someone suggested putting marks on the bomb aimer's perspex and a bar to keep his head in the right position. And from that, various options were investigated. One of them, of course, was this version uh, of the site, which is the one that's shown in the 1955 film. This is a photograph of a weapon, which, of, of a site, rather, which is believed to have been the one used by Maltby's bomb aimer, John Ford, uh, in his uh, final release against the Myrna Dam. I mean, it is identical to, in, in all respects to the, the one on the film, and one suspects that the film company had access to uh, this or drawings of it uh, for the site that they used. But the other method that was used was putting some China graph marks or some tape marks on the bomb aimer's perspex, tying a piece of string, uh, again, so that when it was pulled tight against the bomb aimer's nose, he was at the right distance to create that isosceles triangle. Some bombers found this easier than holding the, the handheld sight because at low level, lying on your stomach and trying to brace yourself in an aircraft that's buffeting around was, was difficult. At least this gave you a bit more, bit more chance to support yourself. Now, of course, the site was tested initially at Derwent Valley Reservoir in Derbyshire. And on major commemorations, of course, the Battle of Britain flight Lancaster recreates that. It flies down Derwent Valley as it did last week. Now, in the 1955 film, they actually show the aircraft doing this and dropping bombs aimed at a marker boy. In fact, during their runs at Derwent Valley, the squadron didn't drop anything. And in fact, the squadron never dropped any bombs in any British reservoir whatsoever, practice weapons or... Uh, any other sort of weapon. All that they did was to, to use the reservoir as a sort of uh, a replica of run, making a run down a lake. It was coincident that Derwent Reservoir and Howden Reservoir both have towers which uh, facilitated them uh, lining up the site on the target so they could practice that side of things, but no weapons were actually released. In fact, the practice bombing was carried out mainly at the range at Wayne Fleet, and this is what it would have looked like. Um, Lancaster there, it's a post-war aircraft, but it just coincidentally has the code letters AJ, which of course were 617 Squadron's codes at the time, although this is not a 617 Squadron aircraft. But it shows uh, a practice bomb bursting near one of the practice targets. Those are what the squadron would have been aiming at initially. Later, they aimed at two white boards, rather like cricket, uh, uh, cricket uh, screens that were put on the, on the sands representing the towers. And inset there is the sort of 
11 and a half pound practice bomb that they would have used, the weapons being uh, fitted with a flash or a smoke puff so that the point of impact could be measured by the range staff and the accuracy assessed. Later on, the squadron practiced against other reservoirs, for example, like Ibrook Reservoir near Uppingham, which is said to represent the Myrna Dam. Well, top, right, uh, top left, you've got the Myrna Dam. Beneath, you've got Uppingham Reservoir, Ibrook Reservoir. There is a degree of similarity. The, the biggest difference, of course, is the scale. But you'll notice that Uppingham Reservoir, apart from being an earthen bank, it doesn't have any towers. And to facilitate practice, they actually constructed dummy towers out of scaffolding and camouflage scrim and mounted those on the dam crest so that the crews would have something to aim at. The other reservoir that was used was Abberton Reservoir in Essex. And that's it bottom right there. And people say that, well, that represented the Ada. But as James showed, and as you can see from that photograph there, the terrain and the topography around the Ada is incredibly steep and hilly. Abberton Reservoir is in Essex, and it's almost as flat as a pancake. So I can never quite understand the, uh, the, the, the sort of comparison between the Ada and Abberton. If you wanted to uh, select a lake that's more appropriate to the Ada, I think you'd probably be better off selecting something like Oldswater or uh, somewhere in the Lake District. Now, of course, the other essential ingredient in, in training, and that was the spotlight altimeter. One in the nose and one in the belly to converge at 60 feet on the water. And of course, the traditional story depicted in the film is that um, it came about from watching the travelling spotlights in a theatre production. In the film, it's shown here as a review show. In Paul Brickhill's book, Gibson's Navigator is reported to giving it a more colourful origin while he was watching a strip tease act. <laughs> Alas, both are apocryphal. This is the origin of the idea. It dates from the First World War. It's Captain Jenkins' night height projector, it's seen here fitted to a, an aircraft called the B-2C. The lights used by the squadron were fixed to converge at 60 feet. These First World War ones were adjustable to any height up to 500 feet. Two fixed lights shone a sort of pair of brackets on the ground, and a third light shone an image in between them, and the angle of that was read off to give the height. The idea was developed in the interwar period and used as an altimeter to help flying boats land at night. And it was also fitted experimentally to Hamden's for judging height over the sea when mine laying. So it wasn't exactly an unknown idea, it was just a very old one that had been dusted off. Now this is the moment you've been waiting for. What about the dog? There he is at Coningsby, in front of a Lancaster. Gibson had acquired him as a puppy down at West Morling in Kent when Gibson was down there flying bow fighter night fighters with number 29 squadron. The inset photograph bottom left shows him again and if you look closely you'll notice around his neck there is an iron cross. If you go to the Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon, there in the case alongside Gibson's medals are his dog, or is his dog's medal the same iron cross and it's just cut out of a flat piece of metal with the, with the uh, I, I think it's the owner's name rather than the dog's name on it. Um, but um, of course Gibson was a great dog lover and we all know the tragedy of the story is that the night, or the, before the raid the dog was killed. And this is the gravestone of the dog. This is the current one. The original one was actually, again, it was marble, but it was made out of the top of an old washstand. And when you look at it there, you'll note the date. Killed by a car on the 16th of May, 1943. The account also says that the car didn't stop. That's wrong as well. As far as... as 
far as I can gather, the car was owned by a garage owner from Fiskerton. Um, he braked, his passenger was slightly injured, and the, the vehicle did stop. There are also rumours about the burial. He was killed on the 15th of, of May. The morning of the 16th of May, Wing Commander Gibson goes into the squadron engineering uh, section and asks a flying officer in the station workshops to make a coffin for the dog. The engineering officer refuses. Gibson has a shouting match with him and leaves without a coffin. So it's believed that a parachute was used instead for the dog's burial. The question is, of course, was he actually buried outside Gibson's office underneath that stone? Gibson had given instructions to the squadron dis uh, disciplinary officer flight sergeant, uh, NCO flight sergeant Powell, to bury the dog outside his office at midnight, just as we will be going in for the attack, he says. And I'm tempted to think that Powell would not have risked Gibson's wrath by not doing so. But there is a story going around that at a post-war reunion, late one, late one night in the bar, that Powell, standing up after a few drinks, started to say, if you really want to know about the dog, before being whisked, whisked away by other squadron members. However, for those who have a sort of faith in that sixth sense that animals have. The marker was removed during the filming of the Dan Busters film in 1954. And the dog that was used in the film, which actually was an army mine detection dog, seen here with Richard Todd, that dog would not go anywhere near the spot of the grave. He flatly refused and could not even be dragged there. So, one sort of wonders. Now, of course, another belief is that a lot of aircraft were shot down on their way to the target. For the entire raid, air, eight aircraft were lost. Only three were shot down on the way in, two were shot down on the homeward route run, and one was shot down over the Myrna. This is a still from the film showing Flight Lieutenant Astor being hit by flak. However, Flight Lieutenant Astle was not hit by flak. His was one of two aircraft that collided with high tension cables. Another aircraft was extremely fortunate in that it actually flew so low that it went under high tension cables. Aircrew witnesses in Astle's formation, which has become slightly spread out, say that they saw Flack coming up to meet Astle's aircraft and then saw the aircraft explode and crash. The reality of it is that they were playing back in their memory what they expected. Flashes which they took to be like Flack and then the explosion. But in fact what they had seen was the explosion as the aircraft hit the top of that pylon, setting fire to a wing tank and then the aircraft went down and exploded on the ground. And the flashes that they see were probably the high tension cables shorting out and it running along the length of the cables. That's the remains of Astor's aircraft the following morning. And today a commemorative stone marks the crash site where seven men died. Now, you remember in the first talk, James was talking about how Wallace, when he was given the green light to develop upkeep, came out of Millbank and must have been thinking that his bluff had been called. He had proposed this idea, which he believed certainly would work. But, of course, we all know that when you are suddenly called upon to prove it, you have that double take and you think, I hope I got my calculations correct. And Wallace commented to a colleague um, very much that sort of feeling of 
feeling under, under great stress and great pressure to actually deliver this weapon now. And sensing Wallace's plea, the colleague sent him a prayer of supplication to Saint Joseph, who is the unofficial patron against doubt and hesitation. Now, in the road alongside which Astell's aircraft here crashed, there was a wayside shrine. That is the statue. It's Saint Joseph. Again, a shot from the, the film. Here's uh, the sort of model work of squadron leader Maudsley attacking the Ada Dam. He releases his bomb too late. It goes off underneath the aircraft, which can be seen banking there on the right-hand side. In Enemy Coast Ahead, Wing Commander Gibson's account of the operation, and in Paul Brickhill's book, it describes this attack. It says that a radio call was made to Maudsley, who was heard to reply faintly, was he all right? Yes, I think so, stand by. And that is the last that anyone saw or heard of squadron leader Maudsley. The inference, of course, is that the aircraft was destroyed by the detonation of its own bomb. For the film purposes, it would have been difficult to leave such a sort of resolution literally hanging in the air. So they took an artistic license or creative license and the aircraft crashes into the hillside beyond the dam, thereby explaining what has happened to the aircraft. But in reality, Maudsley managed to fly his aircraft, perhaps badly damaged, back as far as Emmerich on the River Rhine, but he was slightly off track and ran into the defences of that port which shot him down with the loss of his entire crew. After burial in a Dusseldorf cemetery, they were exhumed and are now reinterred in Reichswald Cemetery near Cleve. Well, those are just some of the examples of the myths and legends that have surrounded Operation Chastise, which as you see, some have an element of truth in them, others are perhaps have grown some out of ignorance, others from a need for secrecy, some the result of popular misconception or the result of journalism and the media. But I hope I haven't destroyed your image of the Dam's Raid and I hope that I've shown that even with well-known and oft-told stories, there's often always something new to uncover. Thank you. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.